Take your Bible this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 6, and just kind of hold your finger there for a while. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 6, we're doing part 2 this morning on the nothings from worry. This is actually the last message of the entire series we've been doing for probably over a year at least, but uh, part two of nothings from worry. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the message. Thank you again, Lord, for the opportunity today to look at what your word has to say about this issue of worry. And Lord, when we look at the mess that the world is in today, it provokes worry in the lives of many people. So Lord, help us to glean the biblical truths that we share today about worry and help us not to be a bunch of worry warts but learn to just trust in you focus our lives on you even in difficult scary times we ask these things in jesus name amen you know worry never moves you one inch closer to a solution to the problem you have in your life doesn't get you closer in fact worry creates more problems for you those worried about losing their hair accelerate the process and end up losing it anyway. Those worried about getting sick weaken their immune system and end up many times getting sick again. Those worried about losing their jobs can lower their performance at work and end up losing their jobs. Those who are worried about gaining weight sometimes will eat more because they're worried and gain the weight that they didn't want to gain. Worry cannot change the past and it cannot control the future either, beloved. It makes you miserable today, however. It can leave you with nothing, with no joy at all because all you do is worry, worry, worry. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. That word heaviness can also be translated worry, fear, or anxious care makes the heart stoop. You know, something else about worry. Worry is opposite of contentment which is the attitude that we're supposed to have in our lives. Many times we just worry about the wrong things. True contentment, however, is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to worry because of the Father, our Father in heaven, that we have as believers. He cares for the birds. He cares for the flowers. And you know what? He can take care of you and me too. We tend to worry about the future. And we worry about the lack of control over our own lives. God, however, He wants us to trust all these matters to Him. He says, bring it on. Give me your cares. Give me your worries. I'll take care of it. Just bring them to me. I don't know about you. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> and look at verse 26. I want to read something here. It says in verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. <coughs> Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought, of, thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which, it, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not under thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You know, worry shows that we have problems in our lives. This was brought out by a gentleman named Jim 
daily. Jim is the president of Focus on the Family, and he was the successor to James Dobson. In the January 2013 issue of Significant Living, Jim made a very surprising, sobering, and profound statement that might cause more worry for worriers. He said this, Worry is a passive form of arrogance. He explained, it is believing that you know how things are supposed to turn out. It's taking God's seat for yourself. We don't worry because we fear God's will won't be done. We worry because we're afraid that things won't go our way. You know, there's a great deal of truth in what he said. Beloved, we are not to worry because of our faith in God. Because we know the Lord, we're not supposed to be consumed by worry. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whether shall we be clothed, for after... For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. That's God's antidote for worry. Worrying is inconsistent with our faith. It's, it is a char- characteristic of unbelief. Our worries and our fears do not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but only empty today of its strength. We are not to be focused on our frustrations. Instead, we are to seek God's will and we are to seek His righteousness. That's what He instructed us to do. With the Master of the universe. Just hold on and let think that sink in for a minute. With the master of the universe living within us and watching over our lives, we really have no reason to worry at all. People try to encourage us when we go through a trial in our life. But you know what? Even though they encourage us, we still worry anyway. The September 2004 issue of Reader's Digest told about Debbie Williams who was working at the ticket counter at a very busy airport. There was a screaming baby that had, the, that had all the passengers' attention as they stood in line to get their ticket. A man stepped to the counter and he looked at the infant that was exercising his lungs. And then the man just kind of rolled his eyes, you know. Trying to assure him, Debbie said to the man, Now, sir, don't worry. Chances are that baby won't be on your flight. The man shook his head and replied, Oh, I bet he will, lady. That's my son. (laughs) Yep. People try to encourage us. But we still worry sometimes. We are not to worry about our future. Pastor John Hagee said that a gutsy pilot accepted the challenge to fly around the world. He stopped occasionally to refuel and to meet with the news media. One day as he was drifting through the silent skies above the Atlantic Ocean, he heard a gnawing sound among the electrical wires. A rat had climbed aboard and was inflicting potential damage to the plane's electrical system with its razor-sharp teeth. The pilot began to worry. Listen, I'd just be worried if there was a rat on the plane, okay? I hate them. I can't stand them. I hate little mice, too. But the pilot began to worry and to anticipate... uh, the potential demise of his future, 
uh, he remembered that rats were created by God to live on the ground instead of in the air. So guess what he did? He flew the plane higher than he ever had before, perhaps on the verge of outer space maybe, I don't know. But it was a new world up there for sure. And the rat succumbed to the altitude, which has basically hardly any air up there at all, and the rat died. That's how he dealt with the problem. And you know what? Worry, when we think about that story, worry's just like a rat. The next time your anxieties rise, fly higher in your fellowship and your walk with God. And you'll be amazed how your, your worries will begin to dis dissipate. Lord willing, your worry will die. You know, Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We are to be concerned about today. And what God wants us to do today, what's going to happen tomorrow will take care of itself tomorrow. Today is the day to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior if you do not know the Lord as your Savior. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation, said Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Once we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to serve Him, and He will give us peace when the trials come in our lives. You think those families down there in Texas have been going through a trial this way? I cannot, I cannot, cannot even begin to comprehend what they're going through. And I can't begin to comprehend what those police officers had to deal with when they went into that classroom and saw the massacre of all those children. Blood everywhere, I'm sure. And those bullet-ridden bodies lying there on the floor. I, I just can't even comprehend it. The trauma that the officers felt. And I know if those parents saw that, they would, they would have probably, a lot of them would have lost their minds. How tragic, how terrible. But you know what? God can give peace even in times like this. Isaiah 26, 3. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. In fact, in the Hebrew, it reads, Thou will keep him in peace, peace. The word peace is listed twice. God gives us double peace when we trust in him. He is the antidote for the worries that we have in our life. He's the antidote for a heart that is full of fret. He gives us peace. I'll give you peace, peace. You know, three key words are connected to victory over worry. Number one, faith. Number two, father. And number three, first. Seek God's kingdom first. God's solution to worry is praying. Praying is the secret to a carefree life and having God's peace in your life. Rick Warren offered a challenging statement when he said this. He said, if you prayed as much as you worried, you would have a lot less worry in your life. We're to be careful for nothing, the Bible says, but prayerful for everything. Notice we are and can pray about everything. Our Lord is interested in even in even the small little details in your life. He's concerned about the test that you have to take maybe on uh, Tuesday. He's concerned about uh, maybe an interview you're having for a job this week. He's concerned maybe about maybe you, uh, you're having a meeting with your boss this week. He's concerned about that meeting too. God's concerned about all the details of your life. You know, prayer in general is an act of devotion. It's an act of worship to the Lord. Supplications are special, specific petitions and urgent prayers for particular needs that you have in your life. We are to offer these prayers with thanksgiving. Learn to, you know, just learn to, to, during the day, learn just to talk to the Lord throughout the day. Just talk to Him. What do you mean? I mean, when you're shopping at Walmart and pushing your cart, as you're going down the aisle, just say, well, Lord, what should I get today, you know? Are there any bargains today, Lord? 
there any bargains in the store? Would you lead me to that path? And show me where those bargains are. You'd be amazed how God's concerned about sales. He is. He'll lead you to something that's only. Well, I mean, that's happened to us many times in the store. But, you know, in this day and age, man, you want to get a good deal in the store, especially when you're buying food. I'll tell you what, you've got to mortgage your house now to buy groceries anymore. But you know what? God's concerned about the little things in your life. You know, our prayers and petitions must be mingled with praise and, and rejoicing. In his book, in the book, This Is Your Brain on Joy, Dr. Earl Henslin describes how joy and anxiety travel the same pathway in our brains. There's not enough room for both to simultaneously occupy the path. So we can choose which one gets access to our brain. We can choose joy or we can choose worry. If we open the gate for joy, worry has no room to come along. Perhaps this is why Nehemiah said that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Praise has a way of taking the sting out of our circumstances and helping us to be grateful for the blessings we do have. Man, how many times do we get focused on all the problems and worries and forget about all these blessings that we've got and what God's done for us in the past? We forget all that because we're just focused on, oh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. You know, we're singing that Wizard of Oz song. God wants us to focus on Him and not forget about what He's done for us. You know, when we pray, we must always remember three things. Remember the love of God, which desires the best for you and for me. Remember the wisdom of God which alone knows what is best for us. Remember the power of God, which can bring to pass that which is best for us. Remember those three things. Now something else. Right praying depends on the right mind. Paul stressed in Philippians chapter 1 that if we have a single mind that is focused upon Jesus Christ and not double-minded, then we can give the Lord our adoration. That's in chapter 1. If our mind is submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ, and not proud, not cocky, then we can come to the Lord with our supplications, as chapter 2 of Philippians stressed. If we have a spiritual mind that is described in Philippians chapter number 3, we can express our sincere appreciation for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we put into practice the Bible principles that are taught in Philippians chapter 1, 2, and 3, then we can have a secure mind that is described in Philippians chapter number 4. Praying about everything and worrying about nothing is God's will for the believer. Doing this will give us peace in our lives. God has his own way, beloved, of taking care of us. And it's, so, it's amazing how he does it so many different ways and in unexpected ways. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce shared the story of a man named Hotchkiss that went to... Nigeria and was a missionary there for 40 years and one day he was late for a church service that he was to conduct in a village lo located across a huge large flat plain. There was a rule in Nigeria in those days that no one ever crossed large open spaces for fear of stampedes by herds of wild animals that grazed the countryside. You don't want to go out there in the open. That's a no-no. You don't want to do that. A safe path could always be taken with a short run along the trees. Well, Mr. Hotchkiss, he was late, beloved, and he knew the quickest way 
to that village was across those flat plains. So he started out across the plains, and sure enough, about halfway across, he was caught in the path of a rhinoceros stampede. Uh, I don't think any of us have had to go through that lately. Amen? All right. He was trapped with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. He was out there in the middle of nowhere with no cover at all. The rumbling thunder and dust cloud continued to approach the faithful missionary who hugged his Bible to his chest. And he knelt in prayer and said, Lord, I'm coming home. That's what he believed. It seemed like eternity to that missionary as he waited for the inevitable. The roar intensified, and his heart beat faster and faster and faster. Hello. Yeah, I think so. But then the roar began to soften and fade away until everything was quiet. Hotchkiss got up and found himself in the midst of footprints from, one, from over 100 rhinoceros. He was actually alive. He couldn't believe it. He's, he's still alive. I'm alive. I'm sure he's, he's touching himself. I'm alive. I'm alive. It was a miracle. And he went onward to the church service like, you know, well, that was interesting. You know, well, let's go to church, you know. <laughs> but that's what he did. And he gave God praise for the protection he gave him that day. Well, years later, a couple from Ohio visited Hotchkiss in Nigeria. In the course of their conversation, the husband said to the missionary, You know, I had a most unusual experience one time, and it involved you. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night with an irresistible urge to pray for you. I did, and I committed you to God's protecting care. And I, then I went back to sleep. So Hotchkiss asked him if he remembered when that took place. Do you remember when that was? Do you remember the time? And the man had written the event down in his Bible that very night. When they compared the times, it was on the same day and the same hour that Hotchkiss had mirac miraculously been spared on that Nigerian plain. Beloved, never underestimate the power of prayer and do not ignore the urges of the Holy Spirit to pray for others when He's nudging you. I can't recall how many times where God will nudge me to pray for somebody out of the clear blue. And I know, you know, somebody's people I haven't thought about 10, 20, 30 years ago, you know. But all of a sudden, I, I start praying for them. But when that happens, you know what I do? I get on the phone and I call them. And I said, and of course they're shocked to hear from me because a lot of times they, you know, I haven't seen them for years. I said, the reason I'm calling you today, I'm calling to see if you're okay. Well, why are you, why? I said, last night, God told me distinctly to pray for you. And I don't know what's going on in your life. The last time I did this, I had called a pastor. And he told me, yeah, I'm going through the fire right now. I'm really going through a great trial, great struggle in my life. And that's why God prompted me to pray for that preacher and encourage that pastor. Never fluff off those promptings of prayer. Now, let me say this. There are some folks who should be worried this morning. They should be worried about their eternal destiny, where they will be after they die. The October 23, 2008 issue of the Houston Chronicle printed a story about Ariane Shireen who was a comedy writer in London who organized a publicity campaign advocating or promoting atheism. That's what she wanted to promote, atheism. 
in her response to distaste for a Christian poster on a London bus. The 28-year-old started raising money for an advertisement rebuttal. Initially, the campaign was planned for four weeks in January of 2009. London's red buses carried ads stating this. Now, here's what was on the ad. There's probably no God. Now, stop worrying and enjoy life. That was the ad on the buses going around London, England. Shireen stated, I thought it would be a really positive thing to counter the idea of non-believers spending eternity in hell by putting forward a much happier and more upbeat advertisement saying, don't worry, You're not going to hell. As the old adage goes, thinking a bad idea is a good idea is still a bad idea. Asserting that there is, did you catch that? Probably no God, that you are not going to hell if you don't believe, and the enjoyment of life can only be found with such a resolution is not only a bad idea, it's nothing short of declaring one's own stupidity. David put it this way in the scriptures, the fool has set in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good, Psalm 14.1. Understand this, if you die without Jesus Christ, you will for certain spend eternity in a place called hell. And you will never get, you'll never get out of there. I don't care what kind of posters you put on red buses. They're not going to do you any good if you die and go to that place. Uh, You will have nothing for eternity but agony if if you die without Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's something you should be worried about and That's something you can change today by trusting in the Lord for your salvation. Hell is very real. It does exist, and it will exist for eternity. Revelation 21.8, John said this, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Heaven is for real. Salvation is for real. You can be saved today, and you can know you are on your way to heaven. That will remove a lot of worries about death. Give your heart to Jesus today. But understand this, your good deeds, your good works, your church membership, all that's good. But that is not going to save your soul. Only Christ can forgive you and cleanse you of your sin. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. John said in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants us to know we're on our way to heaven. That's where the joy comes from. Know where you're going. Knowing you're on your way to heaven. You can know that today by trusting Christ as your Savior. If you are wrestling with worry in your life today, turn those worries over to the care of God in your life. And just, sometimes you're just going to have to remind yourself, just don't worry. Rod, don't worry. I see something on TV and I said, oh, great, this is coming. Uh, Don't worry, Rod, you know. Just learn to trust God. And you'll be amazed how he'll give you the peace that you're looking for in your life.